For Krima Media's Polity, I'm Tabi Madiba. Joining me today is journalist and author Nick Dahl and writer and publisher Matthew Blackman, here to discuss their co-authored book, Spoiled Ballots, The Elections That Shaped South Africa from Shaka to Cyril. Your book dishes the dead on pivotal events in the country's history, but it also sheds light on a dozen lesser known contents, starting with the assassination of King Shaka in 1828 and ending with the anointing of President Cyril Ramaphosa at Nazareth in 2017. So why did you use the South African elections to explain the key issues and implications of their outcomes? We've worked on a book on corruption um, and we, as we were working on that book called Rogue's Gallery on the History of Corruption, we realized that, you know, there was a story to tell about corruption in democracy in South Africa as well. Um, and not just ordinary sort of financial corruption, but also corruption of keeping the vast majority of people away from, from the polls and excluding, you know, races. So we thought that that would be a good lead on from what we'd written before. Um, and, you know, it did seem like every election, we could move towards every election and describe just the changes in South Africa, just what had happened in South Africa over the years between the elections. So we used the kind of elections as a kind of focal point to get to, to get across a, kind of the whole narrative of South African history. And I think what we also wanted to do was to show how strange and peculiar our history is. It's, it's definitely not the history that I think most people think it is. I think most, particularly young people out there, think of it as a very simple narrative. Okay, there was, you know, there was racism and then Mandela, you know, was released from prison. And that is the kind of narrative that that's built up and, and it's not as simple as that. There, you know, there were so many people fighting different causes and the politics over the years, particularly within the ANC, for example, you know, changed considerably um, because of the of the times that um, they were living through. Nick, please talk to us about the background research involved in putting this book together. It took a lot more work than we expected it to take. I mean, the book ended up being quite a bit longer than we had planned it to be as well. But I mean, we're very happy with the end result. I mean, the research basically involved a lot of reading of a lot of different voices. But, uh, but something that we also need to mention is that all the experts we consulted about the various elections. So each time we wanted to write about an election, we would discover who is the person who knows the most about this election. And we'd reach out to them and Often it would be a fairly short conversation, but they'd just point us in the right direction and say, make sure you read this, this, and this. When we'd finished writing the draft of each chapter, these experts were always kind enough to read the drafts and say, oh, you need to change this, or I think you need to add in a bit about that. So, I mean, the book really wouldn't be what it is without their input, and they deserve a huge thanks. Can you explain to us why a black man at the Cape had more rights in 1884 than at any point in the next 140 years? That is a very interesting part of our history, particularly within the Cape Colony. The Cape Colony was a very strange place. There had been a group of, part of what are known as the 1820 settlers had moved here, and they were a educated class that had largely come from Scotland, or certainly uh, the ones that, that had this kind of liberal outlook. And they came to the Cape Colony believing that they were going to um, not just farm, but kind of set up some kind of, in many ways, a sort of ideal society. And these people, like John Fairburn and Thomas Pringle and a guy called Dr. Philip, fought very hard on issues to do with race. They believed that all men were created equal. and they believed very strongly in certain liberal ideas and they brought that into the Cape Colony and they fought very hard to establish a government that would recognize all the people of South Africa, it, of course, or all the people of the Cape Colony that qualify that, but of course it wasn't perfect. You know, the, they had their own prejudices of their, their day, but certainly by 1854, when the first election was held, men of a certain 
age over 21 and a certain who had a certain amount of money if they owned property or they had a salary over a certain amount of money, which was relatively low at the time, could vote. And actually also all people who held property in community, for example, tribes who held their land in community could also vote as long as it was over 25 pounds could could vote of course the problem was a lot of the people at the time weren't necessarily educated they didn't you know fully understand what this democracy was going to be about you know there were a lot of teething problems around that but it started off quite well in 1854 and then unfortunately what happened was the slow sort of progress or regress towards um, the finding of diamonds and the finding of gold and people like Cecil John Rhodes who came out to exploit not only um, the minerals of the country but also the people and that's when certainly in the Cape Colony the troubles began and more and more racial legislation started being applied within um, the legislation of the Cape Colony. So it started off quite well and many of these people believed that it was going to progress, but sadly it didn't. And I think that is a narrative that we see again and again and again in South Africa. If you look at Mandela's narrative, it's, it's, it's relatively simple. Talk to us more on why the rent riots broke out in 1922 and the political consequence for young smarts on the 1924 elections. The Rand revolts, which took place exactly a hundred years ago, basically what happened was white miners on the Witwatersrand in Joburg objected to a chamber of mines plan to remove the color bar. Now the color bar was a, a racist piece of legislation that said black miners could not work in skilled or semi-skilled jobs. So it basically guaranteed all the best work for white miners. Now the Chamber of Mines wanted to scrap the policy not because they were lovers of democracy or they, they cared about the plight of black miners. They did it because they wanted to reduce costs. They knew that if they could employ black miners in skilled or semi-skilled jobs, they could pay them less and they could reduce their overheads. I don't think they had catered for the scale of the white miners' objections. It, it was basically the white miners, they went on strike as people do today. But after a month of getting nowhere, most of them had war experience, either in the Boer War or the First World War. So they formed themselves into commandos based on military lines. And on the 10th of March, 1922, at five in the morning, they, they launched an all out assault on the state. So they just started ambushing police stations around Joburg throwing hand grenades into police stations, sniping from the rooftop. So for about seven days, there was all out war in Joburg. Halfway through the revolt, Jan Smuts, who himself was a very experienced military leader, came in and he, he took control of the situation. He, he brought in the army, he brought in tanks, he bombed Joburg from the air, he brought the revolt to heel. And, and he quashed the rebellion. About 250 people died in total during the week. But the problem was that in quashing the revolt, Smuts had brought together two political forces that before then hadn't had much in common. The Afrikaner working class, who were represented by JVM Herzog, and the English-speaking working class, who generally voted for the Labour Party of Colonel Cresswell. So they had a lot of differences, but the Rand Revolt meant that they had more in common than they had apart. And uh, in 1924, Smuts was defeated at the polls by a pact between Herzog and Cresswell. And Herzog became the first Afrikaner nationalist prime minister in South Africa's history. And almost immediately, he set about laying some of the foundations of apartheid passing, uh, for example, an Immorality Act that was extremely similar to the one that was passed in 1950. It's a massive moment in our history. You write that the new South Africa was delivered tired, unhealthy and gasping for breath, but it was nevertheless a miracle birth. The recovery would be long, and as we see it today, it is far from complete. 
So please explain to us why you feel this is the case. I think one of the images can play a strange role in our lives. And I think the image that of Mandela sort of winning the election in 1994 and then the Rugby World Cup in 1995, people think of the transition into democracy or, you know, proper full democracy in, in the country as some kind of smooth road. And it really wasn't. When Mandela got released in 1990, there was already violence in the country. But it set off amongst all groups of people, um, amongst Zulus, amongst Afrikaans, um, right-wingers, uh, incredibly awful violence. That, um, and it swept across the country. And even in Cape Town, there was terrible violence and rioting. And massacres, one massacre followed the next. We got through by the skin of our teeth, I think. We really, it was, it was touch and go with a few weeks to go before the 1994 election. We, we were in a state of complete chaos. Nobody knew whether the Encarta Freedom Party would even recognize the election and what that would mean. Luckily, it all came together in the weeks leading up to that election. It came together, but a lot of people died and a lot of violence was perpetuated and a lot of bombs were set off even during the days of the elections. And that is just not something that people remember. I mean, I lived through that as well. I, I tend to forget that when I think of sort of Madiba magic and what an incredible moment that was. We forget how violent it was and how close we were to falling into utter and total chaos. Do you think Ramaphosa will survive the ANC's 55th elective conference in December this year? I think he will. Just uh, so the, the chapter we wrote on the two ANC conferences at Polokwane and Nazrek, we decided that Post-94, there's not much point in focusing on general elections because the real power is decided at those ANC conferences. That chapter was probably the most complicated and multifaceted one of all to research because there are just so many people involved and so many allegiances shifting. But I think overall, in its simplest terms, I think the conference this year is more likely to be like Mangaung than like Polokwane or Nazrek. I, I don't see an incumbent president being ousted at an ANC conference, definitely not Ramaphosa. That's my gut feel. It seems to me that when they're coming towards the end of their second term, that's when these, the really big reactions happen. I may well be proved wrong, but, but my feeling is he'll, he'll stick it out. Looking ahead to the 2024 elections, do you think there is a good chance that South Africa could be entering into coalition government? I think that's a very difficult question, and it's possible. Just how that coalition will work is difficult to tell. I mean, it's very strange that things like there's been interaction between the EFF and the, and the DA and um, Action SA. I mean, it's, it's a strange... Whatever coalition there might be, it's going to be a strange one and it's going to not be a comfortable one for any of them to accept. It's difficult to see how the opposition, the opposition needs to organize itself and they have failed to do so for so many years. Whether they will get their act together, it's difficult to say. And whether the ANC under a Ramaphosa who might be stronger after um, the next ANC conference, he might pull a kind of rabbit out of a hat. I think at the moment, it's, it's very difficult to see how these coalitions would work. But who knows? I mean, we're, it, 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 the, the local elections did seem to suggest that there were, you know, divisions and fault lines developing. So maybe we will, but I can't imagine who will lead that coalition government. And lastly, what do you hope people take away after reading your book? I think that, that hopefully it'll give them a, a greater appreciation of South Africa's history. We, you know, we, we made a big effort to write it in a very sort of accessible manner. We put in 
you know, it's thoroughly researched. There are loads of footnotes, but we've also made quite a lot of jokes and included lots of pictures and stuff because we want people who don't generally read history books to read this one. The main reason we want re people to read the book is that we, we're passionate about South Africa succeeding. And we, we don't think you can map a positive future if you don't know your past. I think there's just so many people pointing fingers at one another without much understanding of where it all started. If you understand the 300 years that have led up to what makes people who they are, I, I think you'd be a lot more understanding, more compassionate, and hopefully work together. That was Nick Dahl and Matthew Blackman speaking to Krima Media's Polity about their book, Spoiled Ballads, the elections that shaped South Africa from Shaka to Cyril.